the thing I think where I would maybe speak to and meet your your concerns, Nick, are that, uh, and it, it sort of ties it all together. I feel like there's a real, um, I feel like there's a real sort of loss of strategic fluency mm. in the U.S. policymaking establishment. The idea that the adversary gets a say, the idea that there are inflection points and there are momentum points where things shift, where you go from the defensive to the offensive. And I think it works both in, uh, in negative ways, both when the US foreign policy making community becomes overconfident or over alarmed. And I'll give a particular example because Russia to me seems like the particular example. Uh, over the past uh, seven years, especially, um, uh, there's been this sense of uh, fear and alarm about Russia, Russia's resurgence. Uh, Russia's replacing us in the Middle East. Russia's moving into Africa. We're about to run a piece today on a more realistic appraisal about Russia's role in Africa. Um, Russia is uh, you know, going to roll through the post-Soviet space um, and reestablish its sphere of influence, um, maybe. Uh, the problem is that uh, with that is that Russia's neither just a gas station with nuclear weapons, nor is it some sort of behemoth hegemonic uh, steamroller that's going to replace the United States. Uh, it has a lot of internal problems. It's fairly easy to play a spoiler role uh, when you're dealing with a global power like the United States, and you can go in on its coattails. No one's counting on Russia to protect them in the Middle East. No one's counting on Russia to, uh, to, to sort of guarantee a, a regional security order, whether in Europe or in the Middle East or in Asia. So it's easy to go in and pick off some, some, uh, some, uh, some loose parts here and there and to, to step in to, to, to find, uh, to have preponderant power in a local environment. That's relatively easy. And it's something I think Putin has been good at. And I think the Russian military has proven, I was somewhat skeptical at the beginning of the Syria operation. Mm -hmm. The Russian military has proven it is, it can project force, it's smart. It has a good doctrine, strategic doctrine, tactical, operational, you name it. Is Putin a strategic genius? Well, we'll see. I personally think it would be a disaster for him to invade Ukraine. Will he do it? Maybe. It was a dis I thought it, was a, it would be a disaster for the U.S. to invade Iraq, and we did. Um, it's very easy to fall into that sort of hubris. And so I think that's where the, U the U.S. alarm over Russia become, starts playing to our disadvantage as well. Basically, my, my reading of it is that Russia has played a defensive position really well. They've now achieved a certain uh, a, a state of stalemate, if you'd like. I think China probably has as well, where, like you said, we can't compel yeah. We might not even be able to deter, but should Putin and Russia, should Russia invade Ukraine? That's a real inflection point where from the defensive, and this is, you know, straight out of Klausevich right. and classic strategic theory, the passage from the defensive to the offensive is a dangerous point because it's where your compressed force and your compressed momentum and dynamic momentum starts extending outward. And as we know, when a coiled spring springs out, it has a lot of force and then it reaches its apogee and that's where it loses its power. And I'm, it, it's a, I think it's a real open question, especially given all the instability right now, and we could talk about that in the post-Soviet space, whether Russia has the resources yeah. to uh, stabilize Kazakhstan, uh, shore up Belarus, uh, intervene in Armenia if necessary, and try to hold Azerbaijan and Turkey, uh, keep them honest in, in that theater, and commit, what are we talking about, 100, 120,000, maybe more uh, troops to uh, invading and occupying and holding territory in Ukraine, which uh, I would say is a much more capable military right now than Saddam Hussein's, for instance. Um, and with a lot more uh, friendly neighbors willing to channel uh, support and aid and uh, with a lot more um, repercussions on the economic side than the U.S. ever faced from Iraq, from the Iraq invasion. So again, it's just all a way of saying um, the adversary gets, this, gets a say. The U.S. will have 
enduring challenges and 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 uh, and pitfalls to avoid in in trying to uh, uh, advance its interests. Um, but having said all that, so does China, so does Russia. Uh, and I think we are definitely entering into a period where they will more and more try to challenge the United States, try to test the United States resolve on uh, core interests. Uh, and, and, and I think if I have one real sort of um, major concern for 2022, it would be whether the taboo against interstate warfare mm. for conquest uh, holds or not. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. And even if it were, for instance, in the, in, in the realm of a cyber attack that passes more clearly than we've seen in the past into a real act of warfare with the kind of impact that we understand as being bellicose and, and an act of war. Um, that I think this, these next 12 months, for me, that's where the biggest danger is. Um, and even there again, that might then reinforce that taboo. It might reinforce a backlash, we don't know. But I think if I have a, a more pessimistic or, or alarmed concern, that would be it right there. Um, so I guess to, you know, clouds on the horizon, certainly Ukraine is one, um, a, a massive cyber attack that, that sort of, we, we all know what it, what it will look like. Yeah. Um, we all know theoretically what it will look like, whether we're, but I think um, that kind of, uh, shocked but not surprised event um, in, cyber, in cyber warfare could very well take place in the next 12 months.